Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Alexandra Kalev. She is Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Tel Aviv University in Israel. She is developing an evidence-based approach to managing diversity in corporations and universities. And today we're going to focus on her book that was written together with Frank Dobin, Getting to Diversity, What Works and What Doesn't. So, Dr. Kalev, welcome to the show. It's a huge pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It's my pleasure. So, uh, let's start perhaps with the definition. So, what is a diversity program exactly? Um, well, diversity programs are a newer version of equal employment opportunity programs that employers have put in place in response to J.F. Kennedy's executive order from 1961. So back then, the order um, required federal contractors to take affirmative action to ensure that applicants are employed and that employees are treated during uh, employment without regard to race, creed, color, or national origin. And later, in 1964, the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act outlawed discrimination on the basis of race, color, uh, religion, national origin, and sex. Uh, so, as early as the 1960s and during the 1970s, large American um, employers voluntarily adopted uh, different types of programs to bring in more non-whites and women into their workforce. So, they had sensitivity awareness training, they had um, a mentoring programs, they had a special skill training programs to, to, to bring in more uh, blacks especially. Um, uh, these were not too widespread, but uh, they were very widespread among the large companies and companies also adopted equal employment opportunity officers and affirmative action officers. So everything that we know now about diversity had previous lives as uh, a previous life as equal employment opportunity and affirmative action compliance programs. In, the 19, in 1980, uh, President came, uh, Reagan came into power on the promise of small government and budget cuts. Uh, he didn't believe in government in enforcement. And this, this basically sent a message to employers, don't worry about anti-discrimination, don't worry about these things. The government is not going to uh, look behind your shoulder anymore. You, you, can, you can let that go. Uh, and this is when the diversity discourse started taking over. Because affirmative action officers and equal employment opportunity managers didn't want to go home. There was a profession that started to emerge and they were not going anywhere. Instead, they rebranded uh, equal opportunity as diversity management and legal compliance as the business case for diversity. Um, so in short, to your question, the diversity program is a rebranded version of equal employment opportunity programs that come to reduce career barriers and open career opportunities to all. Mm -hmm. And to what kinds of contexts do diversity programs apply? For example, what kinds of institutions can we find them in and stuff like that? And they apply everywhere, everywhere where you want equality where you want democracy, you need everyone to participate, right? So diversity programs are important everywhere. Obviously in corporations, um, the workplace and work, uh, you know, that's the source of our income and our livelihood and workplace, uh, what happens in the workplace affects the entire society uh, because it affects access to health and, 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 and everything else. So obviously we want uh, diversity uh, at the workplace, but also we want diversity in the classroom, right? You want the, the girls who talk as much as the boys in math classes. We definitely want diversity in universities. We want fa diverse faculty. We want diversity in governments, uh, both in the political aspects, parts of the governments and in the administration. And we, uh, we, 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 we talk about this book to universities, new uh, governments, uh, state departments, for example, in the US and so forth, because uh, allowing everyone to participate is the, the, basic, um, the basic component of, of, of democracy and of successful societies. And that's why it, it applies to every context. Mm -hmm. 
Uhum. And uh, are there different kinds of diversity programs? Yes, there are um, different kinds of diversity programs. Uh, basically, if you look, even even as early as the 1960s, as I mentioned earlier, uh, definitely since the 1930s, we can identify two general approaches to diversity. One approach targets individual biases and the other targets structural biases, okay? So uh, organizational biases. Now, both biases are uh, sources of inequality, but um, do you hear the police outside? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, we have some demonstrations here outside. Okay, uh, so both biases, individual biases and um, structural biases are sources of inequality, but targeting individuals has individual biases hasn't been as effective in creating uh, actually it creates damage usually while targeting structures uh, promote significant change um, so targeting individual biases is um, done in two main ways one is training programs and the other is uh, grievance procedures so training programs come to teach you about your biases and try to reduce them and grievance procedures uh, give employees opportunities to uh, complain when you acted upon your biases, when so they felt that someone discriminated them. Both basically point fingers towards managers or well, faculty, blame them, punish them. I can tell you from now, it doesn't work. Targeting systemic bias or structural biases is done by um, basically looking at the organizational structures and routines, the way we uh, actually manage our human resources, and, um, and, and creating a context where everyone has the same conditions to reach their full pot potential. Uh, this is done usually with initiatives such as formal training programs, targeted recruitment, um, is a ta the diversity task forces, work-life supports. These are the kind of uh, programs that target um, systemic bias. In addition, we have uh, there have been uh, programs that come just to supervise or institutionalize change. For example, having a diversity manager, what used to be the Equal Employment Opportunity Manager, or uh, task forces or um, equity reviews and. Um, and in, in, in target diversity targets, I'm not saying diversity goals because there are no goals, but uh, but there are plans, diversity plans. Um, so, so these are the, the, the general kinds of diversity programs, yes. Mm -hmm. But when you mention, for example, systemic bias, are you talking about uh, specifically about implicit bias or not necessarily. I'm asking you about implicit bias because that's something we hear a lot about uh, from people who work on diversity programs, right? Yes, no. Uh, systemic biases are biases that are uh, rooted in the everyday routine of organizations where uh, systemic biases are, for example, if organizations only uh, recruit in Ivy League schools where the representation of minorities is very small or uh, if they allow mentoring to just uh, emerge grassroots so we know that if there is only that two black women women in, in this location of the firm the chances that they will have a mentor are lower not because anyone directly discriminated against them but because the system is biased the structure you mentioned implicit bias Mm -hmm. That's uh, a, that's something totally else. A, it, implicit bias is in our head, so that's back in the individual bias a part. So there is a lot of hype about implicit bias. Um, first, it's good science, and we have this very, very deep wiring that we are not always conscious of. Uh, and that we, 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 we start developing implicit bias since we since day one since you know we have babies that are dressed in blue and girls in pink and black is evil and white is pure you know all these endless messages that we get from our environment at school culture movies everything is creating this wiring and it's actually also uh, it has evolutionary um, functions when you are out in nature not, not today today we are hardly out in nature it's important that you very quickly 
able to distinguish between good and bad, you know, yellow and red. The colors have meaning and we need to do it very quickly. So our cognition is wired to create these categories and our culture is feeding us categories that are embedded in the culture. We don't need them to survive. Uh, so yes, implicit bias is real and deeply, very deeply rooted in our um, cognition. But there is why I, I mentioned earlier that there is a lot of hype about complicit, uh, implicit bias, not because it's not real, but because the weight of implicit bias in determining inequality at work is way lower than people want to think. I mean, if, if you think, okay, I am biased, but it's implicit, I, I'm, I'm, I, it's unconscious, I'm not aware of my bias, it's almost like get, letting yourself, uh, forgiving yourself, letting yourself um, just be, uh, continue to be the, who you are because you can't control it. There was once a big uh, headline in, I think it was Fortune or Forbes, one of the business magazines saying, white men can't help it. What can I do? I'm unaware of my biases. Uh, they try to train me out of it, but that's what they, uh, we can do. So no, a, a implicit bias doesn't matter as much. What matter is, um, first, that it's close to impossible to, to reduce in, implicit bias in training, but second, that there is a lot of discrimination that is happening because of explicit bias. If you look at uh, complaint files, you know, that people submit to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, I look in Israel or in, in the US, you see horrible cases of discrimination, like um, this black person that um, they kept asking him if he's sleeping with his daughter. Is that implicit bias? You're like unaware of it? No, it's not implicit bias, it's explicit. Or this woman coming to the office, seeing her picture uh, on, a, on a naked body and hang, hang in, the, in her cubicle. That's not implicit bias. So we have a lot, that, these are two examples I, I can uh, go on. We have a lot, a lot of evidence of very explicit, direct, violent bias. Uh, and that obviously um, is a source of discrimination and inequality at work. And the second thing is that a lot of discrimination happens because of structural or systemic bias that I mentioned earlier. There are fewer support networks for minorities. There is a lot of distrust. They, 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 they're in a larger need of work-life supports and they get it less. They have longer commutes. So there, there is a lot of structural bias that is not because of any one specific uh, bias. And all these are the reasons why, yes, implicit bias exists, but that's, that's not the first thing we need to take care of when we think about increasing diversity. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but when it comes to the kinds of uh, diversity training programs and diversity programs we see set up across different institutions to, uh, I mean, targeting um, systemic bias, for example, do they work, generally speaking? Those that target systemic bias, structural bias, yes, generally speaking, they work. Uh, so in the research that we have done in the book, um, we, we, we look at whether the diversity programs work. When we talk about work, what, what does it mean that the diversity program uh, is effective? So some people, for example, some uh, even employers, they uh, measure um, people's feelings after diversity, diversity training. And mm -hmm. uh, if they uh, record that people feel better, feel uh, that they learn something, they say, okay, the, the, the program is working. We actually look at numbers. We look at whether after you put diversity program in place, years after, like because it takes time, you know, to change diversity. People have to leave in order for other people to, 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 to enter or to be promoted. It takes time. And that's why it's often difficult to measure. You want to see that in the period, in the few years after you put a diversity program in place, you actually see change in the numbers and in numbers uh, of um, uh, women and minorities in good jobs. So what we see is that programs that address systemic biases, for example, targeted recruitment or mentoring programs or um, work-life supports, I don't know to what extent you want me to detail on each of these now, uh, they definitely have significant 
effects on the entrance of women and uh, people of color. We look at Blacks, Hispanics, and Asian Americans uh, to management jobs. And we want management jobs to be diverse. These are the most, most important jobs, not only because we are upwardly biased. Unfortunately, most of our research is upwardly biased. But when management is diverse, it will trickle down. It will trickle down in, in terms of the uh, policies that, and, and also in terms of the hope and the mentoring opportunities and the role models that uh, people from underrepresented groups in lower level jobs uh, get and see when, when they have diverse management. Uh, and what about uh, harassment uh, training programs specifically? Because that's another issue people worry about in the workplace at uh, educational institutions, for example. Do those work? So for harassment, that, that's a very good question because, you know, usually the, the entire discourse of harassment is separate from the discourse of diversity, mm -hmm. uh, partially because the discourse on harassment is still very much tied to the law, you know, um, uh, and, um, and diversity is trying to disengage itself from the law to become a more a business or moral discourse. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I think um, mentioning the law, unfortunately, doesn't do good to managers' motivation to comply. But um, it's important to think about harassment as a diversity issue, because when people are harassed, they don't work as well, they don't stay in the company. Uh, I mean, it's, it's bad for the company and it's bad for the individuals. Most, if not all, I would say all harassment programs today Definitely in the US and in Israel, I can talk about these two locations, are of the kind that targets individual bias. That's the kind that uh, point fingers, create uh, reactants, create backlash. Um, in fact, with harassment training, for example, you see that um, people that score high on likely to harass a scale before training, mm -hmm. score even higher on that scale after training. So it's not that like, okay, you know, we did diversity training, we did harassment training, it didn't change anything, we wasted money and time, but okay. These actually uh, are damaging. They uh, uh, increase group boundaries, they increase tendency to harass, they reduce the trust between groups. Uh, they increase the uh, sexual harassment training, increases the chances that people would think that women um, are not trustworthy and that their complaints are just made up. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, does that mean that, for example, uh, diversity training programs and harassment training programs and even rules that people set up at companies, educational institutions, etc., can they backfire sometimes? They do. They backfire. Um, diversity training programs backfire because they, they are usually mandatory. They usually uh, present diversity as um, present the goal of diversity as just the goal of compliance. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like external. It's imposed. And people, managers, don't don't, uh, don't react to it well naturally. So it's like you make me sit in the room. It's mandatory. Uh, all we're worried about is legal compliance, not about anything else. And managers, like like all other people, don't like to feel uh, controlled. We talked earlier about uh, evolution, and uh, the feeling of control is something that people react against. Again, it's an evolutionary trait that we have. You, you want to be free and autonomous, and especially managers. Managers are born or, you know, recruited. They, they, their jobs are to lead. And if you just point finger and try to uh, uh, tie their hands with rules, they, they kick back. Um, they kick back. And um, again, justifiably to their, according to their logic, to their professional logic of, uh, of wanting to lead. Uh, and managers easily find ways around the rules. If, uh, for example, you have to um, you have to 
perform skill tests before you hire someone. So, you know, they ignore some of the results of skill tests when they want to hire someone that didn't do so well, and they emphasize the results of skill tests when they don't want to hire someone that didn't do so well. Or they start giving low performance uh, evaluations a few months before this, they, they start um, before they lay off a person, right? So um, and that also you see in complaints later in, um, and in courts that um, managers rig the system in a way that will help them um, basically choose and promote and recruit people according to what they want rather than those rules. Eventually, what we find is that, for example, after putting in, in place skill tests, there were fewer women and um, all the non-white groups that we examined, uh, uh, black men, women, Asian, Amer Asian American men, women, and Hispanic men, and women in management, there were fewer. The, the, the skill tests themselves are culturally biased, and managers just use them eventually to justify their own biased decisions. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, tell us, uh, how can companies and institutions keep track of progress? I mean, is it that the way they're doing it is the correct way? Or if not, what are the most rigorous ways of doing it? Yeah, so recently, actually probably in the last 10 years, uh, companies, especially big retailers and big high-tech firms started um, showing the numbers, putting their numbers on the web. Uh, and that's a very uh, good way to track progress. Why? Because you create transparency, you create accountability. You know, these are the numbers and now my customers, uh, uh, my, my clients or uh, future uh, potential workers are seeing them. So one way to track your progress is actually putting it out there and this create this kind of accountability. I want to look good. I must say that it doesn't work so much. The numbers haven't changed in the last 10 years uh, for most companies that are putting them out there. Uh, another, uh, another, important, um, another important feature of tracking your success is actually breaking down the numbers. Don't only look at you know, the overall rate of women or, or you know, blacks. So you, you want to break them down first by gender. It's a huge difference between black men, black women, Asian men, Asian women in, in their success rates. So you want to break down the numbers. You want to break down the numbers um, by gender. You want to break them down by level. So if you say my overall um, workforce has 35% women, 8% um, blacks, are these black men or women? And where are they located? In the lower level uh, frontline jobs or are they located in management? And where in management are they located? Okay, so you want to have hard numbers, you want them broken down also by location. So, uh, Microsoft, for example, they, um, uh, I think it was just before the Great Recession, or maybe it was now in 2013, they um, show large increase in the share of women in, um, in their workforce. And then they had layoffs and all the, that increase uh, went down again. Why? Because they closed certain locations and all these women that uh, were shown in the increase a year earlier were in those locations. So they were really segregated. Uh, you, women and people of color are usually recruited to locations that are more um, or that are less central to the company, that are um, valued less. And you know, when layoff and downsizing comes, these locations will also disappear first. This is why, you know, to really see if you are um, succeeding in your diversity goals, you also have to break it down by location. Um, Okay, so we have the breaking down, we have transparency, we have uh, also, you know, look at the numbers, not, not only collect them, but also look at them and think about, okay, where are my bottlenecks? Why I have a problem with um, a Asian American men in this location? 
or with black men or women in these jobs. Where am I? So use the numbers. When you track success, you track your own success. So you need to use the numbers in order to identify bottlenecks and, um, and, and, and understand why they're happening and devise solutions, which is the job of diversity task force and diversity managers. Mm -hmm. So earlier I've asked you if diversity programs can backfire, but can they also be rigged or not? So, yeah, grievance procedures, uh, for example, are totally rigged. By rigged, we're referring to just having a, like a facade of a, a procedure, a fair procedure, but in mm -hmm. fact, the procedure is not fair. So grievance yeah. procedures, grievance procedures are basically, again, allowing an employee to complain, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, if they feel that their rights were um, not granted, if they feel that they were discriminated, what happens is that they, again, the playing field is not even, you're complain, complaining into a hierarchy that also employs you and has no interest, no interest in addressing your complaint. Why? Because managers are first more socially, obviously socially connected to uh, top management. They are repeat players. They have more resources. They have more defense. Uh, they know uh, how to go about with this. Their jobs are not on the line. They're not afraid of losing their jobs. If you complain, if I complain, I would be afraid to lose my job. I don't have any support networks. We see cases where, um, you know, a woman comes to her HR manager and says, uh, you know, this guy, he keeps looking at me and touching me and doesn't let me work. It's like, I, I want to file a complaint. And the HR manager would say, yes, this guy's a jerk, I know, but you will never hear me saying that up there. Okay, because the HR manager who is support, who's supposed to be on your side and to help you with your complaint he is part of the hierarchy and they are also afraid on the, uh, to lose their job. So the system is rigged in a way that you don't have a judicial system, a, an objective, independent system that will actually take care of the complaint outside of the um, interests of either employees or employers would just take care of the complaint. What happens is that uh, people are afraid to file a complaint and they're right. Sorry, people are afraid to file a complaint and they're right. They're right because um, as far as we know, 60% of the people that file a complaint experience retaliation, which is isolation, more harassment, uh, removal from their job, uh, sometimes even demotion and these are the numbers that we know you know these probably other people don't even talk about it. other people don't even talk about it so if you file a complaint you face retaliation most complaints end with maybe a slap on the wrist maybe of the a harasser or the person that discriminated but for the person that complained this complaint have have very heavy personal cost they are again socially isolated, um, usually harassed, they, they, they need to, um, if the complaint goes further, they need to spend a lot of money on, on legal defense. Um, these cases sometimes end in bankruptcies and divorce, in deterioration of health and well-being. Alternatives like um, having an ombudsperson, you, you need to have, for, for, for a grievance procedure, for, for a complaint system, to be really um, effective, you need to have it placed outside of the organizational hierarchy. When it is within the organizational hierarchy, it is rigged. You have to have it outside. Some companies do uh, this kind of anonymous um, storage house of complaints where you can file anonymously uh, a complaint and you can decide that you don't want to do anything about it at this point. But um, managers can look and see where complaints are aggregating. They can have a map of, you know, the, the red zone, this department, in this department or in that department, or this location of our firm, there are a lot of complaints. So even though no in, individual complaint was actually filed, management can come and see, we need to check what's going on here. 
so these are more effective ways to, to deal with um, complaints. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, before asking you the next question, I, I was just going to say, and I'm not sure if you agree with this or not, but I mean, we're talking about uh, diversity programs here, but uh, some of the ways you mentioned there, for example, power dynamics between uh, the fact there's a huge power differential, uh, for example, between people in management and uh, w just common workers. I mean, th that's also something that many times workers unions point to. And I mean, b we hear a lot of the time from um, people who are managers and so on that w common workers come to the table with the, uh, negotiation power and all of that. But uh, I mean, that doesn't seem to be the case at all if we find that there are those huge power differentials there, right? And I mean, we're talking about diversity here, but perhaps some of that also would also be the case for uh, workers in general, right? Well, unionized workers are stronger and unions are repeat players just mm -hmm. as managers. Uh, at least in the US and in Israel today, um, unionization is very uh, unionization levels are very low so your average worker especially non-white and women is less likely to be represented by a union when workers are represented unions don't always uh, share the same interests as the particular so if uh, if a woman um, feels that she's discriminated against because of work life for work-life um, struggles. Yeah. Um, for you, unions don't always have the um, uh, don't always have, for example, work-life balance on their agenda. Historically, unions were, you know, created by white men. Mm. Women didn't stay after hours to help with union organizing or be part of union organizing because they had to go home to the kids. Um, so some unions, so, so we have very few unions and some of them do promote also diversity agenda, others don't. Sometimes diversity agenda is actually, um, cont actually contradicts the union agenda. If, for example, women complain about pay gaps, but the reason why men are paid so uh, much more is because of the seniority uh, protections, you know, and rules that unions promote. So seniority is... Uh, basically a way to discriminate against women if you look at it from the diversity perspective. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit complex. You, you cannot take a union help for granted, but when it exists, it definitely solves some of these power imbalances. And, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and do targeted recruitment programs work? Yes, so targeted recruitment programs are very effective. What happens, they're effective for two reasons. Mm -hmm. One, is that uh, one one reason is that the, so so targeted recruitment programs are very effective uh, for two reasons. Mm -hmm. One is at the functional level. Okay, so if you only recruit in Ivy Leagues, um, there are only so many Hispanics, Blacks, maybe even Asian Americans. Well, that's a uh, they are more representative in, represented in higher education. But let's talk about Blacks and Hispanics, there are only so many of them that will enter your pipeline, your rec uh, recruitment pool, just because they are underrepresented in Ivy League schools. Um, and if you keep doing that, then it is like a non-fault non discrimination, right? Because that's the pipeline. And yeah, we interviewed all the Black uh, students in that class, but there were two. Mm -hmm. um, or if you recruit through um, uh, your employees and your employees are mostly white and only your top employees bring a new worker, a, a new recruits. Again, it's a no fault discrimination, presumably, right? Targeted recruitment basically means, okay, go to historically black college, go to historically Hispanic college, uh, just go to places, go to the uh, American, uh, Black American Engineering Association, go uh, 
to target pools of workers that have uh, a, that are more diverse. So it's a number game. It works first because of the number game. You go, you you, you cast a wider net, so you'll have more diversity in your pipeline, and you. But it works also because uh, of another reason. When you use your line managers in targeted recruitment, so you don't only send your HR to bring them in, you actually use your line managers to go to Howard College, right? To a, a historically black college. Yes. You open their eyes. They go, they see, they talk, they interact with people from groups that they usually don't talk and interact and interview for a job. And they report back to us saying that indeed the con drop. They realize how many talented candidates there are out there that they just didn't have never seen. Okay, and if they don't recruit this time, they already make connections and they recruit them next time. So you really change people's minds and understanding of the world when you um, send line managers to these recruitment trips. Furthermore, if uh, I recruited you and you actually get the job and come in, I know you. I will want to mentor you or to make sure you have a mentor, you know? I feel some kind of responsibility for your success. I brought you, right? So these people that usually, like usually a black person that gets into a firm is isolated. Through this kind of recruitment, they have it already one in. So these are the different ways in which targeted recruitment works, different levels, and it's uh, vastly effective. We will see, we see significant increases in, in, in more than 10% in the share of um, all groups in, in management, all, all the groups that we're looking at, when uh, companies do it annually. Mm -hmm. So at a certain point there, you mentioned a mentor. So could you tell us a little bit more about things like mentoring teams, employee resource groups? Uh, do they work in promoting diversity? Yeah, so they, they, these are all have in common uh, the issue of, uh, of networking, of social support. So, you know, to succeed in the workplace, you need to be smart and hard worker, but you also need to have social ties. Mm -hmm. uh, because through social ties, we get all these informal resources, the tacit knowledge about, you know, opportunities, behaviors, cultures. We need social ties in order to succeed. And as I mentioned earlier, in, in most workplaces, uh, women, or in, more, in, in, in workplaces where women are underrepresented, and in most workplaces, uh, Blacks, Hispanic, and Asian American men and women are very small groups, uh, isolated, sometimes even in a token, at, at the token level of a single person. Whites and men just don't have this kind of experience. Uh, and when you leave the creation of um, social ties to to nature, to you know, to just the flow, to an informal flow, um, groups remain, uh, people or individuals from underrepresented group remain remain um, isolated. Now, yes, some people say that natural uh, ties are the best ones, right? You, you don't want to be forced to be a friend with someone. Well. Uh, in our study, we, we compared companies where they have informal and formal mentoring, and we see that when the company puts in place formal mentoring that is open for everyone, not only to uh, those that we think that they are management potential, because those already passed the bar, right? Mm -hmm. You want to open mentoring for everyone up and down this, the, 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 the ranks, and you want to... Um, match mentors, not by demographic group. So a black woman with a black woman, how many black women mentors are available anyway? And also why, why to create this kind of uh, segregation again? I mean, there are reasons for comfort, but uh, there are other ways uh, like resource group, we'll talk about it in a second. So you want to match mentors by interest. You want to have people interested in working together, collaborating, right. uh, and, and, and this creates a, a real difference in the chances. First, it, creates, first it, it, it just opens opportunity for everyone. 
uh, new opportunities that, again, underrepresented, people from underrepresented groups didn't have before. Second, it reduces stereotypes and biases among mentors. What you try to do in diversity training and you didn't succeed because you cannot sit people in class and tell them stop being biased, this doesn't work. It happens when you do targeted recruitment, it happens when you do mentoring because just working together, collaboration, thinking together, spending time together on, on things that you're both interested, uh, it makes us uh, invest more cognitive resources in the way we think about the other, and then we start to evaluate them as a person, not as a representative of a group. This is exactly where biases and stereotypes go down. Mm -hmm. So we've already talked about uh, training a little bit, but then with all this information, what are the kinds of training that work the best in promoting diversity? So you also mentioned earlier, uh, you know, you asked so you asked me so do training and roles backfire, and I and I mm -hmm. said yes and explain, but. You know, you can read that in as a conservative in a conservative way. That okay, let's get rid of diversity training. Let's get rid of rules. Let just let managers just roam and do whatever they want. And you know, we've been there. This yeah. is why the American or you know workforces look like that. So um, not balanced and not equal. So we do want training. We do want rules, but we want them in the right time and the right place. And not always. Now, these days, uh, in the last three decades at least, they are the first solution. So you have a headache, I'll give you ibuprofen. You have a problem of inequality, go to training. And then let's put some rules here. If in a company that has um, a diversity task force, that looks at numbers, that finds a bottleneck uh, in um, uh, in the recruitment of, of for example, uh, Hispanic people, or in the promotion of women, they, they find a bottleneck in a certain location. They think, okay, we need to figure it out. How Training can be part of how to figure it out. You know, training about a work-life balance, work-life struggles. So, yeah, maybe we need to have those managers or the HR managers, you know, or, or the workers learn a little bit about a topic that is now related to exactly what we're doing. Maybe the task force members need that training, not the workers. They need training to learn how to you know, convey messages. So sure, we need to learn. We don't know everything. But we need training that is tailored to the specific goals and challenges that a, a, place, a location has. What we see here in, our, in the book is that Training that, again, comes with the legal requirement, any legal mentioning just create this backfire because it creates this externalization of goals. Personally, I wish it wasn't this way, but I cannot fight the, the, our wiring and psychology. But training that is related to specific uh, goals, of uh, business goals or cultural goals, uh, with no mention of um, uh, of, of, of the law, but is, is embedded within the organization, is effective, is way less effective than mentoring, less effective than targeted recruitment, less effective than um, diversity task forces or, or, or uh, work groups, but it's effective in, uh, in increasing, I would say, um, increasing the share of black men, Hispanic men, and Asian American men in management, not women. Mm -hmm. uh, that goes back to your earlier question about uh, harassment. So harassment is about women and work life is about women. Diversity, the, the, there is an implicit gender bias in the diversity discourse that is about, a, it's not about gender and by that it is about men, it's not about women, which, which is again very interesting by itself. And, and shows how much we need to tailor the diversity training to specific challenges. Um, same, for, same for rules. You want to have a skill test, that's fair enough. Does, is the skill test culturally biased? Is it applied uniformly? Is it universal? Is everyone evaluated the same? 
and so forth. So you may realize that you need a role, you need some university standardization, but you want to make sure that it works as you intended it to work. You want to have this oversight, um, and not just um, automatically think that rules will work. They don't. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you think that training should be democratized in any way? Okay, so I think uh, so. There are two types of training that we that may be confused here. There is a diversity training, and there is a skill training. Mm -hmm. Skill training is um, can be a diversity program. Skill training is a, a sorry. Skill training is a source of inequality. Mm -hmm. Skill training often creates a barrier uh, to diversity because. What happens is, um, you know, skill training is usually a um, condition for promotion, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not really open to everyone. Okay. Skill, uh, trainings are sometimes informal, but, uh, and then obviously they're not open to everyone, but even when they are formal, the rules of who can apply to skill training, who can get that training, exclude some groups. For example, oftentimes, a skill training is provided only to full-time workers. Mm -hmm. But many companies today, large retail, all large or almost all large retailers, retailers in the US today uh, put most of their frontline workers on part-time jobs. Not they don't allow them to have full-time jobs. They give them less hours than they want. If you're not a full-timer, you cannot do training. And then we have a circle here, right? You will not get promoted, you will always be part-timer, and you will not have training, etc. So we need to make sure that um, it, what, what does it mean to democratize skill training? To open the opportunity to everyone, it, uh, not to have eligibility rules that exclude some groups, to have it in several languages if it's relevant, not to have it after hours, so people with uh, um, family commitments cannot attend, you know, um, today more and more trainings are online and that's that's good because sometimes they are in faraway locations and again, it's a story of work life gets uh, in the way. So you want to, democratizing skill training is an important diversity initiative and you want to do it by formalizing the training, making sure it is open for everyone, both in terms of uh, managers encouragement and in terms of the eligibility criteria. So uh, I would like to ask you a question about work-life balance. You've been mentioning that several times throughout the interview. So what are some of the main challenges here and what are uh, the groups of people that tend to be most affected by it? So work-life balance is um, basically the idea that work and families and life are both greedy social institutions. They want more and more and more from us. Yeah. Um, and uh, the discourse usually on work-life balance or, or struggle, I don't know if the word balance is, is a good one because there is never balance. There is a struggle that one, sometimes you can win a little bit, sometimes you can lose. Um, the discourse on work-life balance is usually a gender discourse. So work-life balance is women's problem. And it's true, it's a gender discourse because uh, historically men and women, you know, uh, uh, for again, reasons of gender bias, uh, uh, became like, responsible on uh, different social spheres or life spheres. Women are regarded as responsible for the home and family bearing and men uh, responsible for work and, and, and uh, breadwinning. Uh, we will not get into the history of biases that built these expectations, but these expectations definitely build um, employers' expectations from workers and also the discourse on work-life balance. Uh, however, Turns out that work-life balance is good for everyone. That shouldn't be a surprise, but uh, it is um, uh, it is surprising. Or 
it is not something that people think about. First, let, let's talk about white men for, for, for a second, okay? Mm -hmm. We didn't talk about them. Um, and they're not bad guys. And definitely, um, we, we said that a lot of the discrimination is structural. And, uh, and they are also workers in these structures. And in the case of work life, more and more men today, for the last decade at least, if not more, they realize that they maybe have they are maybe having the short part of the stick. Um, they also want to spend time with their families and their kids. And this being responsible for breadwinning means also working 24/7. You know, corporations become more and more greedy, and many men would like to have a better balance. Um, women and people of color not only would like to have a better balance, they often have to have a better balance in order to be able to keep their job, okay? Women, we said, because usually they don't have help at home, and men usually would have a woman that is taking care of a family. Mm -hmm. we, a woman doesn't have a man or help. Minority women and minority men are even in a larger need of work-life support because First, they have less slack, less resources to outsource care. They are less likely to be able to pay for a nanny or whatever. Second, they usually have longer commutes. They usually live in, or, or on average, of course, on average, they would live in communities with bad, uh, with, 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 uh, without good childcare services. So they have more needs. They also have, uh, they usually need to work longer. Even after you're hired, if you're um, a minority or a woman, you're still a suspect. You're still suspect that you're not good enough, that we hired you because of our diversity initiatives, that we hired you because someone knows you, that we hired you because we decided to give you a chance. But you're always suspect. You always have to work harder to prove your Also because you're, you're more, as we said earlier, you're more socially isolated. You have to work harder to, to get those things. So if you have to work harder to stay longer, to take any project that someone throws on your, on your way, you struggle more with balancing your work life. You have less control. Add to that that many companies have informal work life support. Your chances as a, a person of color, worker of color, to get these informal supports are much lower. Again, you're still suspect. You're not trusted, you're not management potential, you will not get these supports. So women and people of color, men and women of color, uh, need these work-life supports more than whites. Uh, so that's, that's their challenge. On the management side, there is a totally different challenge. Management, managers are afraid. On average, we see that managers are afraid of providing work-life supports. They are, I don't know, I mean, maybe I know why, there is this myth that we will not be able to manage if everyone wants flex time and time off and, 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 and we, we will need to worry about kids, people's kids. We had COVID and COVID is probably the best um, test case to, see, to show that we can manage. People can work from home, people can have flex time, people can have their kids on their laps. Okay, and productivity in many industries increased during COVID when people uh, uh, integrated their work and, la and family lives for no choice. Um, so companies, so, so, so that's a big challenge. Companies and management need to uh, believe that you can manage flex time, you can manage time off, and uh, this, the, the, the initiative or the pressure from that has to come from above. Companies, companies that, uh, and management that are providing this kind of support, that are providing their workers with more control over their time and uh, allowing workers to take time off to take care of their families uh, when they have a newborn or someone is ill, uh, and companies that normalize the idea that yes, parents have kids and kids need care. Uh, what we have uh, show, uh, what we have found is that first, 
they see increase in productivity. Oh, we, we show that in the book, other uh, found it. There are increases in productivity and well-being of workers, so you don't lose. And from the diversity standpoint, you see increases in the share of men and women of color in management. These people, when they get the work-life supports that they need, they're able to stay in their jobs. They don't have to leave their jobs because of the work-life struggle. They're able to excel in their jobs and be promoted. So work-life balance is good both for the firm, you get happier and more productive workers, and for the workforce diversity, which is also good for the firm. Um, so it's a really uh, underutilized diversity program. Mm -hmm. uh, that's for work-life balance. Uh, so uh, what would you say is the role that uh, diversity managers can play here? A diversity managers have a very important role. It's important that it will be a full-time or as close to full-time position as possible because uh, for a, a company that wants to take diversity seriously, not just the ibuprofen version of diversity, um, needs to make changes in, again, routine operations. Small changes, not, not, these, are, these are not revolutions, you know, just like casting a wider net, having a formal mentoring program, democratizing skill training. These are not revolutionary changes still. You still continue the work you do, you just do it a little bit differently. Diversity managers need to um, co coordinate that, not to manage it. It's a little bit uh, a subtle point here, okay? First, you want diversity manager to be from business. Uh, you want them to come either from the company or from another company, but from a business function, from finances, from R&D, whatever, because you wanted them to know how, the, the dynamics, the feel, you know, what, what, what are the dynamics that they're trying to change. And the, uh, you want them to be able to show that they know. You don't want them to be outsiders. Diversity managers should be integrated in the top management team and they should coordinate the top management team's work on diversity. So diversity management is not a separate function. Okay, you need diversity management in everything you do. So they need to co coordinate that, to coordinate the task force, to co coordinate the line managers going out on those recruitment trips that we mentioned earlier, um, line managers and top management doing mentoring, mentoring everyone. So, so that's, um, so that's one, one part of diversity managers um, job is to bring in diversity to the entire firm. A second part is to create this kind of social accountability, to create a, a, a an environment where diversity is an issue, where when you recruit, when you promote, when you put, when you assign people to projects, you know that at some point you have to talk about your considerations. And at some point, someone will raise the issue of diversity. This, um, this is called accountability. And in psychology, from psychology, we know that a when you know that you, people will ask you about your decisions, again, you put more cognitive resources in your decisions. So studies show, for example, that when two groups of people went over CVs, you know, evaluated CVs of people, um, and one group said, at the end of the trial, on the, at the end of the test, we will talk about the test. Nobody mentioned gender, nobody mentioned inequality, they just said we will talk about your, your, your task. And the other group, didn't have that uh, preview. They didn't tell them we'll talk about it later. And both groups have the same, uh, had the same piles of CVs that they had to sort for different jobs and different uh, starting salaries. And uh, those participants in the group where they already previewed that they will just discuss the experience, uh, showed significantly lower gender gaps in assignments and in uh, pay than the other group. So there is kind of like a trigger, accountability trigger, that the mere presence of a diversity manager that comes to talk with you, not about like, how did you do on your diversity numbers? Not, it doesn't have to be like that. It's just like, 
how are you? How is it going with the your with our diversity and inclusion in this location? Do you need anything from me? Do you need any help? Do you want to talk? You know, it doesn't have to be in a supervisory, managerial, uh, enforcing, mandatory, uh, blaming way. It can be in a and it should be in a brainstorming, collaborating way. We mentioned earlier, managers need to be engaged as leaders, uh, but it creates this uh, accountability. So that's the second part of uh, the job of diversity manager. And the third is indeed to collect those data that we discussed earlier, to use those data, to show the data to line managers, to everyone. When you see num numbers have a huge impact on us. We don't believe stories. We don't believe uh, advice. When we see numbers, we, we believe numbers. And, uh, and, and when a diversity manager has numbers, they have a lot of power. Mm -hmm. So I have one last question then, and also to sum things up a little bit. So what are the principles that make diversity programs work? Uh, there are many ways to put them. Um, I guess one, one principle is that you want it to be grassroots. You want programs that uh, address real problems of a specific company. Uh, you want to know your bottlenecks and to devise solutions that are relevant to you. You want engagement. You want the programs. In, uh, you want programs that engage your managers as leaders of change. You want them to participate in thinking, in implementing, in uh, evaluating, to engage them. You want programs that target structural bias, not individual bias. Not because individual bias is not important. It's because the, our programs to target individual bias are, are harmful. And when you target structural bias, you get rid of structural biases, of, you know, again, social isolation, uh, segregation, and so forth. And you also change your manager's biases because of the, their biases follow their behavior. So by targeting structural biases, you um, actually solve two problems. And you want to create social accountability. You want um, an organizational environment that is a, that, where, where there are open opportunities to everyone, uh, when, where there are work-life supports to everyone, not to the CEO's body. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and everyone, want to, everyone wants to align with these norms. And this is why I mentioned earlier that it's very important it comes from top management because when you see um, top managers, for example, even, you know, going home at the normal time, so they don't stay over time, they go to the families, you feel it's legitimate that you do it, that you will allow your workers to do it. Uh, you create norms of work-life balance, of inclusion, of open opportunity, um, and that creates this social accountability. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, the book is again getting to diversity, what works and what doesn't. There it is again. So, Dr. Kalev, uh, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the Internet? So if you look at Alexandra Kalev, uh, you can find me and my work. Uh, the book itself is on a Harvard University Press, uh, and it's on sales on Amazon and all retailers. Um, I don't know exactly uh, what more details to give. My email is on the web, on my website. Uh, again, Alexandra Kalev on Google will bring you to my website, Tel Aviv University. My email is there. I'll be happy to talk more um, about the book, about the project. I think, uh, again, diversity is a condition to democracy, and I think it's important to do it right, because we do, we want to do it right, but we don't know how. Yes, uh, and thank you a lot again for taking the time to come on the show. It was a very interesting and enlightening conversation. So, Thank you. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing and to keep the channel sustainable, please consider supporting it on Patreon or PayPal. The links are in the description box of this interview. And if you like this interview, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check the website at enlights.com. 
I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Karen Litzka, Anne Blanchett, Perga, Larson, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernardo Seixas, Herbert Gintis, Olaf, Alex, Jonathan Visser, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Calenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegar, Rui Inácio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Cavana, Jorge Pinha, Michael Stormier, Samuel Andrea, Francis Ford, Tiago Nunes, Alexander Dan Bauer, Fergal Cusson, Harl Herzog, Nuno Machado, Jonathan Leibrandt, John Nyar, Stand Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Eira, Tom Hummel, Sardis France, David Sloan Wilson, Yacila Dez Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Punta, Radan Arzmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pablo Stazewski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, Saima Fzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Doug, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzka, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Buddhafi, Sunny Smith, John Wisman, Morton Eichland, Dr. Bird, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Mau Maria, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Lowacki, Giorgio Stéphanus, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Ruth Towell, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Murray, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Pedro Bonilla, Ziegler, João Barbosa, Bangalore Atheists, Larry D. Lee Jr., Old Herrigman, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Gracies, Tom Roth, D. RPMD and Eager N. And special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafinia, Tom Vanagdam, Bernard Hugni, Curtis Dixon, Belnick Miller, Vega Giddy, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Robert Lewis and Al Nick Ortiz, and to my executive producers, Michel Rujeski, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.